Guys, it's great to have you at the ISC show. Tad Cabasa, please welcome Matt Allen. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. Uh, today, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about catching big fish. We're going to talk about doing it a lot of different ways. Uh, most people expect that we're going to talk about swim baits, and we are going to do that. We'll do quite a bit of that. But we're going to talk about some other options as well, some other ways of catching these big fish. Uh, first off, I mean, how many of you guys are familiar with us? How many of you follow Tactical Bassin or Tim and I on social media? Awesome. Awesome. I appreciate you guys all coming out and supporting us. Uh, now we'll just throw you for a loop here really quick. For those that follow us on social media, how many of you know that we're doing a, a what do we call it, a contest to fish with Tim and I? Is anybody aware of that? Some of you know that's going on? Where's Jared? All right, so for those of you that know we're running a contest, and what it is, if you don't know, if you, if you use Instagram, catch a fish on, on, while you're wearing some of our apparel, whether it's a hat, a shirt, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's a 10 pound bass or a six inch bluegill, doesn't matter. But get on there, hashtag fish with tactical bass in, and on the last day of May, somebody's gonna come fishing with us. We're gonna pick somebody, come out, jump on the boat with us, shoot a video, doesn't matter where you're from, we're just going to go out and catch some fish and have a good time. So Jared down here, Jared's from Kentucky, but we put that thing up on Instagram and he was on it like now. He started putting photo after photo after photo after photo. So we called him up. Contest doesn't end until the end of May, but he's already here. He's going to come fishing with us as soon as the show's over. But there'll be another one here at the end of May. So if you guys want to be a part of that, Get some apparel. You can talk to Tim when we're done or talk to me. He's over there in the corner and uh, we'll get you guys going. But what we're going to talk about today, again, is catching these giant fish. What we're going to start with, because I don't know if you noticed, but every lake, river, stream that we have in this end of the state is completely blown out right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off talking about how to catch fish right now. Uh, because it's not, what's that? It's it's not easy. It's, uh, it's a mess with this muddy water. But there are some things that you need to understand about fishing that muddy, murky, cold water that will still let you catch some big fish. The first thing that you want to understand is that these fish still need to feed, right? It doesn't matter if your lake has come up two feet, 40 feet, what color the water is, these fish, they still need to eat. And what these giant bass do, even the big trout eaters, the fish that only eat swim baits, when this water starts getting nasty and it starts rising like it's doing right now, they go very, very shallow. It doesn't matter that the water's 40 degrees. It doesn't matter that there's zero visibility. As all of this structure is flooding, that hasn't had water on it in what, five, six, seven, eight years, as that water comes back up and floods all that structure, these fish go right up with it. So these giant bass that live out in deep water, that live on humps and they eat trout and they eat kokanee, right now, all of that is out the window. If you pick up a jig and you go really shallow, that's where those giant fish are. This is one of those rare times and I've talked about it in the past, but never to this extent, because right now it's so intense in Northern California. There's so much muddy water, there's so much fast rising water that it's important to understand. If you go out tomorrow, if you're in a lake that's got some color to it, you don't throw a big bait. It doesn't matter if you're a swim bait fisherman, it doesn't matter what your preferences are, you go out and you throw one of three things. The first one is the jig. The jig, you wanna throw a dark bait, preferably with rattles, and you wanna fish it pretty aggressively because you need those fish to find it. But those big females, those are the ones that you're after, those fish in these conditions are gonna press that foot of water, two feet of water, five feet of water. That's where they are because they still need to eat and as that water's coming up, they can't find the trout and the kokanee. 
they're out there floating around somewhere. They don't have the vision that they normally have. So they're gonna get right on the bank. They're gonna follow that water up and they're gonna eat right on that shoreline. If you're a bank fisherman, you wanna fish parallel. You don't wanna be throwing out into deep water. Stay in less than say seven or eight foot. Stay right on the bank. Fish that jig with confidence. You're not gonna get a lot of bites because it is dark, dark water. But when you get bit, it's the right fish. How many people here fish Berryessa on a regular basis? So Berryessa guys know, especially if you fish tournaments, that every spring, when that water gets a little bit murky, somebody is gonna get a fish in a tournament that's 12 or better, and it's on a jig, not a swim bait. Every year, like clockwork. This year, way more than normal. You are gonna see a lot of big fish coming super shallow on that jig. Now, two other ways to catch them in that same dark, dark stained water. One's gonna be the liftless. And hopefully we don't get a giant bite right now because I don't even have hooks on this lipless. But that's an LV500. When this water gets really dark, this is another bait that you can turn to. Again, ultra shallow. We're talking zero to five feet. Those fish are pressing up on that bank. You can take that lipless up there in that really, really shallow water and we don't fish it straight retrieve. Now I'm not saying you can't, I'm not saying you can't throw this out there, run it by a fish and they won't eat it. But the way that we fish it when that water gets really dark is slow. You're gonna fish this almost like it's a jig. You're just gonna barely lift that rod, let that bait flutter, and then you just let it die on its own. So you just pick it up, let it flutter, and that's all there is to that retrieve. But those fish are keying in on that vibration, on that sound, and then when they get right up on it, they can see it. Because again, they're up on that shore to eat. These fish would be preferring to eat one 15 inch trout and be done, but that's not an option. So they're gonna get up there and they're gonna eat everything that they can find because they need to eat more to make up for not getting those big meals. So fish that lipless, ultra, ultra slow, right on bottom, and those fish will key in on that. Now one other bait that Tim and I have really keyed into in the last year or two is the jerk bait. Uh, how many of you guys saw the underwater stuff that we did recently? You got to, you got to see that? Uh, you, can take, you can thank Tim for that, because I was just fishing. He's the one that decided to stop and turn a camera on. I would have just whooped those fish and never told you about it. So you can thank him for that. But uh, the jerk bait is its own animal. What's nice about a jerk bait is that you get all that same sound. You get that really loud noise. Boy, this one doesn't want to run, does it? Doesn't like 20 pound line, who knew? You get all that same sound that you would get out of the lipless, but you can pause that bait right in front of those fish. And as you guys saw in that video, those fish eat that bait when it's paused. They don't eat it when it's running hard. So you rip, 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 and then you just kill it. And you let it just sit there in front of them. And they'll be sitting there in this dark water. They'll be looking for it. And the next time it moves, they'll be on it. And the one bait that I really want to emphasize for right now, if you're going out fishing the next week, two weeks, three weeks, is this Lucky Craft Pointer 100. Uh, this bait, it's actually the same bait we were throwing in that video. Color is totally up to you. You want something that they can see, something that will stand out. But the reason why this bait over something else, one is it runs in that right depth range. You're not gonna get more than about four or five feet out of it if you're throwing it on light line. But the most important thing is that if you take this bait and you set it side by side with that LV500, that lipless, and you shake those two baits. We never knew this until we started watching our underwater video. The sound is identical. They have the same rattle in them to a T. So the way that you can get those insane aggressive bites on that lipless, you can get the exact same bites on that jerk bait. You're just giving them a different presentation.
those are the three things that I would do if I was going out to the lake today. It's, it's not normal conditions out there, but you can still get these giant fish to eat. Now moving on to, to normal fishing, we'll, we'll say, trying to catch a big one once this water clears up, because that's coming, right? Oh, probably second, third week of March, we'll be back to normal weather unless these storms keep rolling. So what you want to do at that point is turn back to your bigger baits, because springtime is prime time to get those giant bites. We're gonna divide this up as we talk about these baits. You know, every lake is different. So we're gonna divide it up according to what the fish in your lake eat. And that's something that you need to find out right away. If you're fishing a lake and you don't know what the giant bass are keying on, that is step number one. Once you've figured that out, once you know what they're keying on, you can figure out the rest. If you're on a lake that has trout and kokanee in it, and it's got decent clarity, that's what the giants are eating. If you wanna catch a giant, not catch a bunch of fish, but you wanna catch a giant, and there's trout and kokanee in there, you're throwing the giant bait. That's, that's the only answer. Uh, it's when and there are other things that those fish are eating. <laughs> Well, that was fun. Maybe that'll happen a few more times. Did I mention they like eating giant baits? And the amazing thing about these fish, these fish come out of the delta. So these fish, ooh. These fish normally eat bluegill, shad, bait fish, but they're a predator and they want an easy meal and that big bait gives them that easy meal. So if you're in a lake, again, that has those giants, has trout and kokanee, your one approach is to throw the big bait. But there are a couple of ways to throw it. The main thing that people talk about, the main thing that we talk about, is crawling that Huddleston, right? You hear everybody talk about that. If you're gonna throw a swim bait, you go slow, and then you go slower, right? That's what, that's what you hear being taught. And that is true. That is probably the best way to catch a true giant. However, there's a short window in the springtime where that will change and these fish will get, oof, these fish will get really aggressive and they will start smashing these baits. And when that happens, you can fish them fast. And this, how many people were at the seminar we did here last year? Awesome. So you guys heard me saying that doing this is getting tougher every year because these giant fish, they don't make this mistake every day, right? They eat that bait one time, maybe two times. They get stung, they get caught. They're not gonna do it again. I think people have this misconception that you know you take that bait, you go out and you throw it and the big ones eat it and the next day they eat it and the next day they eat it and it's just not that way. So as these fish get stung, as they get caught, they get a lot smarter and you start needing to look different, throw different baits, fish them different ways. But this year is very, very rare. Today is a very good day to be in this state, to be in Northern California, to be throwing a big bait. I'm gonna go completely against what I told you last year and I'm gonna tell you this is the year to smash them on a big bait. And the reason for that is that all our lakes are up. Right, Orville's what, full pool? Clear Lake is flooding today. We got spillways all over the place, dumping water. What, what that means, what that means to you is that you're fishing a brand new lake. If you weren't throwing a swim bait seven or eight years ago, that means you're gonna be fishing in places you have never fished before. The water's higher than you've ever seen it. And these fish are going to completely reposition. They're gonna choose new spots. They're gonna choose the best spots and they're gonna feed heavily because just like you fishing in a new lake, they're living in a new lake. 
You take a fish that's five or six pounds, she may not have even been alive the last time we had high water in our lakes. So she's gonna go out, she's gonna find a new spot, set up, start feeding, and you are gonna be the first big bait she has ever seen on that spot. That is prime time. This is the year that you can just go out, throw that big bait, and slay these fish. Now you're gonna run into some trouble, and the trouble you're gonna run into is that there's all sorts of new cover. Right, where you've been fishing the last couple years, for the most part, it's mud bottom. You might have some grass, you might have some rock, but it's pretty, it's pretty clear. As this water's coming up, now you've got trees, you've got grass, you've got brush, you've got all this stuff that has grown the last few years. There's trees in places that were never trees before. So this is going to be the year that you start fishing these baits more aggressively. You can do that with the Huddleston by fishing it faster, or you can change your style altogether. You can go to a boot tail style bait, like an Osprey. You can fish that a little more aggressively. It's gonna put out a lot more thump. I should really check these reels before I get up here and start casting, I really should. But this bait's gonna put out a lot more thump. It's gonna move a lot more water. Nowhere near as natural as that Huddleston, but it doesn't matter. It's playing on that reactive nature of these fish. That tail's got a ton of movement. It's gonna get those fish to fire up and lash out. And even though it's an unpainted bait, it doesn't necessarily look exactly like anything. These fish want that big meal. They'll still pick that bait up. And then the other way to go is gonna be that glide bait. How many of you guys throw glide baits? I mean, that trend has absolutely blown up. We all know that. The glide bait will shine this year. The beauty of that bait is that you can trigger fish. I'm gonna go back to the Huddleston really quick and I'm gonna show you something with this bait. The issue with throwing this style of bait where it's got a vortex tail on it is that that tail is designed for one action. If I speed that bait up, we just get more of that action. And those fish will absolutely lash out. You can fish it this speed around that cover and you can catch those fish. But the downside of this style, let me get this bait down in there, is if I see that I have a follower and I try and do something with that bait, I try and rip it or pop it or get it to be aggressive, the bait doesn't do anything. It just rolls over. It doesn't look good, it just speeds up and slows back down. I made the mistake for years when I would get a follower on my Huddleston of ripping it or popping it or trying to do something and it just, it just didn't work. Those fish were not interested in that. But when the glide bait came along, all of a sudden you had the ability to get that bait to be reactive to get it to be responsive, to work for you into fooling these fish. Because when these fish are following that big bait, they don't want to be seen. That's why they'll come in right behind it and they do that slow follow. They'll get right in on the tail of that bait and they just cruise. I mean, how many guys have had a follower on a big bait that you wish would eat it and it wouldn't eat it? Right, everybody that's thrown a big bait but what happens is that those fish get right in the blind spot, right on the tail of that trout, and they just swim with it because big bass are wired that way. They're curious, they don't have hands. The only way that they can check something out is to put it in their mouth. That's all they've got. So they'll just follow along behind that bait until it sees them. When it sees them, they do one of two things. They either completely lash out and inhale it, or they just turn off and let it go. And that's what happens to you when that big fish gets to the boat. She looks up at that boat, she sees you, she just cruises away. They usually don't bolt away either. Have you noticed that? When those giants follow your Huddleston all the way to the boat, they just sort of mosey back home. They couldn't care less that you're there. That's because those fish are so dominant they own everything on that spot. That's their house and you're in it. They do not care. They know that they figured you out. You're not fooling them. It's over. 
But when you get a glide bait, now you have a bait, and this is a river to CS waiver. This is one of my favorite glides. When you get a glide, you have the ability to take a follower and get them to react. Because what that bait will do is you just start that slow crawl, just like it's a huddle stint or anything else. You're just cruising that bait along. But when that big fish comes up and gets in that blind spot and you pop that bait, you've created that moment where they've been caught, where that bait now sees them and they have one of two choices. They can turn it loose or they can kill it. When you were fishing that huddle stin or that osprey or any of those baits, you made it all the way back to that boat and that moment never happened. That fish just, oof, that fish just followed that bait all the way back, pure curiosity, made it to the boat, let it go. But when you switch over to that glide and you create that twitch, that rip, you create that moment and you get to choose when that happens, right? You don't have to have it happen right here on the side of the boat. I can halfway out my retrieve decide that's the moment. If there's a follower, I want her to eat it now. And you can work that fish and trigger her. Ooh, that fish is hot. And that fish will immediately get responsive. She's just following that bait, doesn't care, letting it go. But you, you're playing their instinct. You're literally using everything about how a big bass is wired against her to make her eat that bait. And again, the most important thing to understand is not to wait until that fish is right here on that bait on the side of your boat and you're sitting here twitching it trying to get her to eat it. Now, if you're in that situation, of course, try and get her to eat it. But you have the ability halfway through your retrieve to create that situation out there where they don't see the boat yet. They don't know you're there. They think they've pegged a big kokanee or a big trout and they've got their shot and you're not in it at all. When you hook them, you still have enough line out. You can fight that fish. They can get cool before they make it boat side. The odds of you landing that fish goes way, way up. Does that make sense? Or are we making sense here? We're all on the same page? So again, if you're chasing those trout eaters, those coconut eaters, this is what you want to do. You're either creeping bottom, or if we're up in that cover this year, you will not have that choice because you can't creep through five feet of grass and brush and all this new stuff that's growing in the water. So you're going to speed that retrieve up. You're going to get aggressive or go to the glide bait so that you can get those reactive fish to lash out and eat it. Now, the most important thing to understand about these baits, that fish wants it, is how to position yourself to catch those fish. Whew. See, if we had done this out there, she already would have bit it. Now we're stuck boat side. When you're, when you're chasing these trout eaters and these coconut eaters, again, once the water goes back to being clear, once our conditions are back to normal, if, you, if those are the fish that you're targeting, let's say you're at Berryessa, you're up in one of the reservoirs, you're in a place where that's definitely what they're eating. What you want to do with your boat is you want to get up on the bank and you want to fire out and you want to bring that bait up. And it's really important. Oh. There's one. <laughs> Come here. Come here. There she goes. Did I mention that the S waiver is one of the least expensive glide baits on the market, too? Uh, they love them. I mean, there's. What? <laughs> Hey, where are those baits? Speaking of S waivers, where are those waivers? Do you have a waiver? Where's Jared? Anybody? Where are they at? One of these guys has a waiver or two that he's going to give away around here. I don't even know how you want to give it away. I'll let you sort it out. We're going to figure that out here in a minute. But again, going back to how to fish these baits, you want to get your boat up shallow, or if you're a bank fisherman, this is ideal because it's 
We're literally taking our boats, going up shallow, and doing exactly what you're doing from shore anyway, except we're getting our boats all scratched up to do it. So you get your boat right up shallow and you throw out. Now the reason behind that, you wanna understand why that is. The reason behind it is that trout and kokanee as a whole roam open water. They try not to get up on the bank because that's where they get pinned, that's when they get eaten. So they stay in the open. So when you're targeting a fish that looks for them, that fish looks to the open. That's where they hunt. They don't hunt towards the shore. They hunt out looking for that meal. And then they'll go out there, they'll get under that meal, they'll come up and ambush it. But they're not hunting right on the bank. When we switch and we start talking about bluegill eaters, shad eaters, crawdad eaters, all those other things, it's the complete opposite. And you really, you want to take note of that. It's the complete opposite because those fish hide in cover. They get inside the bushes, they get down in the rocks, they get in the grass. So those bass, if a bass spends its life eating bluegills, crappie, it's going to stare straight at the bank all the time. And it's going to wait for something to show itself between it and the shore, and it's going to pin it in there and it's going to kill it. Complete opposite of a fish that eats a trout or a kokanee. Does that make sense? All right, so on that note, let's switch over to those fish that eat those other baits. What do we have here that we can throw? Oh, I guess I have to tie some things on. Now, I'm kind of going to lump all those fish together, but we'll say starting off with your bluegill and your, we'll call them the fish that eat panfish, all right? Your bluegill, your crappie, those sorts of things. The same rules are going to apply you basically have two options. You can go ultra slow, try and get those fish to react, or you can get aggressive and really try and get them to just smash that bait. Same two options. Profiles are a little bit different. Now something that I've talked about in the past, and I still stand by this, is that when I'm fishing in a place where bass primarily eat bluegill, I still very rarely throw a true bluegill profile. And the reason for that is it's a very difficult shape for a bass to eat. I mean, how many of you have seen pictures of a bass floating on the surface with a bluegill or a crappie stuck in its mouth? And they're both going to die that way. What that tells you is that it's tough to get them down. So if you've got a swim bait, that is the exact same shape, it is very tough for a bass to get that down too. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna get a lot of bites and you're gonna hook very few of them. That's the unfortunate reality of that bluegill shape. So the way you combat that is you either throw a soft bait where they can smash it, or you take a normal profile, you take a trout profile, a shad profile, something like that, and you paint it to look like a bluegill. Because at the end of the day, these fish, they don't care that much. They will eat an S waver painted like a bluegill. They'll even eat a Huddleston painted like a bluegill. They really don't care that much. So if you take that slimmer profile that's easier for them to eat, paint it like a bluegill and you run it in a bluegill body of water, they'll absolutely eat it. That's the way that you can get the most out of your bites with that bait. Instead of having those fish bounce off it. And, and I'm not gonna, you know, name names on any company, but there are a lot of brands that make true bluegill profiles and they catch a lot of big fish, but you will miss a lot of those bites. So it's up to you. But personally, I like to take other baits paint them to match, throw that slender profile, and it works beautifully. And you get a lot more of those fish in the boat. This is a Matt Lures bluegill. This one's actually painted like a crappie. Frankly, I can't even see what it's doing in the water. I don't know if you guys know that. You down there, you're looking into a crystal clear tank. All I see is bubbles. I can't see anything from up here to see if these baits are even working right. 
Every once in a while I get my arm ripped. That tells me they're working right. But that Matt Lures Bluegill, that's a bait that you can just get right on the bottom, ultra, ultra slow. You've got that presentation. You're perfectly mimicking that shape but it's still a bait that will collapse when they eat it and they can actually get the hook. So that's one option. And then again, your other option is to go aggressive. The two baits that I use when I wanna get aggressive, one is again, that smaller S waiver. I said S waiver again, by the way, did, did they get their ducks in a row around here somewhere yet? James, did you get your ducks in a row? You got some waivers or what? <laughs> over on that side, he's giving away a couple S waivers. I'm pretty sure he's about to find his way over here, too. <laughs> for those of you that don't know, this is James. James works for River to Sea. River to Sea is a local company. They're out of Richmond. So the guys are all here at the show, which is awesome, supporting everybody. There you go, he's coming. All right, now I gotta go find more stuff. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Did anybody hear that? He said, tell me about the new tranks. All right, we'll take a quick break. Uh, did anybody see that Shimano put out a new reel yesterday called the Tranks 300 and the Tranks 400? So this is that reel. Uh, Tim and I got the opportunity to fish it ahead of time. Uh, we spent a, a full day fishing it and then ours showed up yesterday or the day before and now we finally have them. Phenomenal reel, it's a big bait reel, but it's a big bait reel in a low profile. A lot like the Corrado, but they've totally streamlined it. It's a brand new reel. What I like about it is that it comes in a five to one, but it also comes in a seven to one. It's a 7.6 to one. We have never before had a high speed swim bait reel, and I am very excited about that. I have not put enough days in it to totally have it dialed, but a bait like this, where you fish that bait aggressive, I mean, a seven to one is a no brainer. So if you guys want to check them out, uh, Tim and I both brought them. We'll have them down here at the end. You can handle them. We brought, we brought both speeds, so feel free to check those out. Uh, back to what we were talking about. The other two baits that I use, this is one of them. This is uh, back east, if you guys ever heard of a bull shad, the bull shad swim bait. This is his bluegill profile. And like I said, I really, normally I don't like bluegill profiles, but this one, they've taken all the fins off and it seems to hook up really well. So earlier this year, I had some really, really good days on that bait. And you fish it aggressively. I mean, you can crawl it and it'll swim, but I like to fish these baits hard. I want these fish to react. This is the kind of bait that you'll throw around that flooded grass, that flooded brush, to get those fish to just fire off. The beauty of that situation when they're in that cover is you know where they are, right? When you're out on a big point and you're just slow rolling a Huddleston, in your mind, it could be coming at any time, right? You just don't know when it's gonna happen. But when you get into this profile of a bait and those fish are in cover, I can just slow swim right up to a bush. You say there's a, there's a bush right in the middle of the tank. I know my fish are in it. I come into that bush slow and then I work that bait and you can get them to come straight out and eat it right away. So that's a really good option. And then the other option Again, is that small glide bait. Uh, that little S waiver, it's the 168 bluegill color. That is a bait that we've done so much damage on, it's just not even funny. And again, you can slow roll, you can draw those fish in, and then you get aggressive with it, and they'll lash out. Now, one thing that I will say about this, and this will help you in your own personal fishing, because how many people here fish with a friend when you go out? You guys all have partners? If you notice, this is the same bait, right? This is still an S waiver. I can't really see in the water, but are these fish almost ignoring this bait right now? The small one compared to the big one? The reason for that 
is that when you go out and you're fishing for giants, again, these fish, they're operating on pure curiosity, right? So the bigger the bait, the farther away you'll draw those fish. If you're throwing a 12 inch bait, you may be bringing fish from 30 feet out to have a look at that bait. If you're throwing a six inch bait, you may be pulling those fish from 10 feet or five feet. Your range is not as large. So when you go to the lake with a buddy and you're throwing a perfectly good bait like this, because this is one of my favorites when I go to a new lake to just immediately, did we snag a fish? Is that what I just did? Sorry, sorry girl. We'll get that out of there. When you go to the lake and there's two of you and you guys are both, there we go. And you guys are both throwing a big bait. The guy that throws the bigger bait will pull 100% of the bites. <laughs> this guy down here and I used to fish together all the time. He was behind the camera on some giants. He was in front of the camera on some giants. And I, I may or may not have spent a couple of trips making sure I was throwing a bigger bait without saying anything. But in all seriousness, if you guys are going to the lake and you're both going to throw a big bait and you want to truly be effective, throw the exact same size bait. It doesn't have to be the same bait, but make sure they're the same size. Because if we had come to this tank and started here with a six inch bait, these fish would be all over it. And then when we go to an eight inch bait, they'll be all over it again. 10 inch, 12 inch, they just keep coming back to look at that bigger bait. It's the way they're wired. But when you run it in reverse, they just don't care. They've already piqued their curiosity. They've already had a look. They're done, they're moving on. So make sure that you guys don't throw two completely different size baits because one guy will be seeing fish at the end of every cast and the other guy will get to the end of the day and have never seen a bass. It's just the way it works. But again, phenomenal option for those bluegill eaters. Now jumping from there, we'll go into those fish that eat you know, shad, they eat your other bait fish. This year on Clear Lake, how many of you guys spent some time on Clear Lake? Did you see the shad boom? I mean, it's completely out of control. When that happens, those fish just give into it. They just eat shad because it's too easy. Every time they open their mouth, a shad will swim in. It, why go chase down a big meal, right? It's not like they're putting out any more effort when they just open their mouth and wait for them to swim in. So this year was a little bit different on Clear Lake. We started dropping down the sizes of what we were throwing. My man, drop down size, stuck a giant. <laughs> Paul stuck one a little bit over 11 with me up there this spring, throwing one of the baits that we're about to talk about. Because again, it's very important that you know what your fish are eating. If you show up to a lake where you think they're eating kokanee and they're eating shad and you throw a giant bait all day, you may get some play, you may get a bite just because you're throwing a giant bait and they're interested, but you won't have the day that you could have had. So if they start turning on shad like they're doing on Clear Lake right now, you've got, in my opinion, two swim bait approaches. One is the swim jig and the other is an underspin, which is a small bait. This is the swim jig. The beauty of the swim jig, easy to fish, you get a lot of subtle movement, a lot of secondary action. So it'll pull those fish out because when they're shad, there's thousands of shad, right? They're never alone. So you've got to be the one that stands out from the thousands of shad. So your two options is a swim jig where I have that skirt, that skirt pulsing, it's moving, it's creating that extra action that makes you different than the rest. The other one is going to be switching over to that underspin because now you have the profile. You look like a bait fish, you look like a shad, but you've got that flash. You've got that extra something that makes you stand out from the rest. That is key. With shad, it's, it's an easy profile. It doesn't matter if a bass is eight inches long. It doesn't matter if a bass is 14 pounds. They can all eat them, they all work together, and they put the herd on them. So the underspin is gonna give us that profile that we want. 
but it's going to add that extra flash so you stand out and out of the thousands and thousands of shad in the school you're the one that they decide to eat and i know that when you guys come to a big bait seminar you think we're going to be talking about giant swim baits the entire time but i'll be totally blunt with you this year on clear lake 2016 my biggest bass of the year came on a jig. The biggest bass that one of my clients caught came on an underspin. Last year, 2015, we had the shad in the lake. Now don't get me wrong, we caught a lot of big, big fish on big baits. That's the easiest way to pick one giant out of the crowd. But 2015, my biggest fish of the year came on that pointer jerk bait because they're still eating those smaller bait fish. And that is prime time. I mean, how many people plan on fishing Clear Lake this year? And I keep bringing up Clear Lake a bunch of you. I keep bringing up Clear Lake just because that's my home lake. That's where I am the most. So you can take that information, you can transfer it to any other lake that's got shad right now. But when I'm talking about Clear Lake, know that you can take that anywhere. But the beauty of those shad, what those shad do for you is they make giant bass really, really dumb. And what I mean by that is that if you're at Berryessa and those fish are eating kokanee out in the open water and you swim that giant bait past them and you try and get them to react, she either reacts or she doesn't. And that's it, right? That's, that's your shot. But when you start talking about shad, bass work as a school. They keep those shad penned up working as a team. So you may have five bass working together, you may have 20 bass working together, you may have 200 bass working together, depending on how much bait they're trying to control, but they are working as a team. And those fish will range from six inches to 15 pounds. And they work together because the little fish know once there's shad, once there's an easy meal, a six inch bass, he's comfortable. He's not gonna be food. He's not gonna have one of those big fish turn around and eat him like he might under normal circumstances. So they'll get right in the mix with those giants. What that means to you, why that's important, is that if you can trigger the smallest bass in the school, if you can catch the six incher, the one that doesn't matter, that fish revving up will rev up the rest of them. And all of a sudden, you can have a 15 pound bass completely revved up out of its mind, killing everything that comes in front of it, just because all the fish around it are doing the exact same thing. And that fish would never, never do that if she was out on a point all by herself. So that's a time where you can take a bait like this, or you can take that jerk bait. I'll pick that jerk bait up again. You can take that little jerk bait to schooling fish on a group of shad and you set on the first thing that bites. It doesn't matter if there's a bunch of giants following your bait and you can see them and the little one eats it, you hit that little one. Because all you're really trying to do is get that school angry. Once that school's revved up, once they're aggressive, all those other big fish are gonna fall anyway. And you can pluck them off one by one. For those of you that saw that underwater jerkbait video, you saw that happening. When we had single fish on the jerkbait, they would get fired up, they might nip at it, and then they'd cool back down. But when the school showed up, when all of a sudden there were two fish or 10 fish or 20 fish, and one of them shows interest, the entire school just completely loses its mind. It doesn't matter how big the fish are, they fire up, they get aggressive, and they start eating everything that comes in front of them. So that's one of those times where you can turn to an underspin, lipless crankbait, the jerk bait, and all of a sudden you're catching a 10 pounder, a 12 pounder on your totally normal bass rod, your regular gear, a little bait, little hooks, where that fish would never have made a mistake before. The only other way that I would tell you this year to try and target these giants would be to fish at night. Night fishing is another phenomenal way to get those big, big bites. And night fishing, we keep it really, really simple. 
I don't worry too much about color. Now, if you've read all the books there are to read on bass fishing, you know that if you go out at night, your job is to throw a 12 inch black power worm, right? And drag it around and eventually a big fish will eat it. I don't buy into it. I'm not saying that they won't eat it. I'm just saying that it's not your only option and it's probably not your best option. Now, now that I've gone back to a giant bait, are these fish getting interested again? Are they starting to follow it around and rev back up? As soon as you go to that bigger bait, again, they don't want to eat. They're swimming around in a tank. These fish were in chocolate milk in the Delta like four days ago. They have no interest in eating a 10 inch trout in crystal clear water with 500 people watching them. But it's the way that they're hardwired. They have to look at that thing. They have to figure out what it is. It's the way they're wired. And then if they really want to know what it is, the only way to find out is to eat it. They don't have hands, they don't have feet. They put it in their mouth, find out what it is, and spit it back out. Going back to night fishing. We take two approaches to night fishing. We throw really dark and really bright. My favorite color at night is chartreuse. My second favorite color at night is white. Black is, I don't know, third, fourth, fifth, somewhere in there. We throw a lot of really bright baits. My thinking is that when we're throwing a swim bait or a swim jig or a spinner bait or any of those things, the things that we're imitating are all bait fish, right? We're imitating a hitch, a trout, a shad, whatever it may be. For the most part, all those fish are white and they don't suddenly turn black when the lights go out. They're still white. So whatever they look like in the dark is what I want to look like. Now the chartreuse, that's just so they can find it fast. That's a bold color, especially on a big moon. That's a different story where they can just see it from farther. If they're aggressive, they'll come in and eat that. So the approach to night fishing, if you want to do it this year, now summertime and wintertime are different. What I'm going to talk to you guys about is cold water because that's when it's the easiest to get that giant fish. Now, if you go night fishing tonight, I'm gonna to tell you right now, I mean, somebody will go out and prove me wrong. I'm gonna get a message tonight that says, I went out and smashed them. But I'm still gonna tell you that in my opinion, if you go out tonight trying to catch a giant, you'll probably get one bite. But when you get that one bite, it will be a giant. In the wintertime, at night, especially when conditions are not prime, those big fish feed up in the dark. Ooh, that's a big fish. Eat it, eat it. I saw that one right through the bubbles. That was a big one. So when you go out there in the dark, two approaches for you. There's gonna be the slow approach, there's gonna be the fast approach. The slow approach is the swim bait. Throw that bait out, a Huddleston is perfect for it, an Osprey is good for it. Anything that you can get right on bottom and just go slow. And when I'm talking slow, we're talking, I'll turn this reel so everybody can see it. We're talking slow. Well, let me get over that rock. That's your speed. As slow as you can stand to go. Now, when you're out at the lake right now and you're looking at that muddy water, you're thinking if I'm going slow, especially with a bait like this where there's no real movement, how is that bass ever going to find that thing in that dark water? But the reality is that bait is so big that even going slow, it displaces water. Just like when a, a boat drives by across the lake and then a minute later a wake hits you, that boat displaced water and it just keeps right on going. When this bait's coming through the water, it's displacing. It's pushing water away from it. And when you're going slow enough that the fish can feel that displacement and then come see what it was and you're still there, they're going to find your bait. You don't have to be going fast for them to locate it. So the approach is ultra, ultra slow. As slow as you can stand to crawl that bait. One of the beauties of that winter night fishing is that when you do get a bite, you're gonna get your arms ripped off. They don't kind of eat it. They don't come up and taste it. If they go through the hassle of tracking that thing down in the dark, when they eat it, it's a massacre. 
You'll be out there in the freezing cold, you can't feel your hands. If I'm in my flip flops, I can't feel my toes. And you're wondering if you're even gonna know that you got bit. And then you get hit so hard, you're just trying to hold on to the rod. Because that big fish is living in cold water. She doesn't want to expend tons of energy for nothing and not get her meal. If she puts the time and the effort in to track it down, when she makes her move, she is going to get her meal. So she will jolt your arm like you have never been hit before. Now the other approach is to fish a little bit more aggressively, even in that cold water. When I do that, I do it with one of two baits. It's either gonna be the jig or the spinner bait. Now we've already thrown the swim jig, so I won't even throw that again, but I am gonna tie the jig back on because I want to explain how we fish that jig in the dark because it may not be the way that you would expect for us to be fishing a jig in the cold, in the dark, in the winter. We fish that bait pretty aggressively. The problem with the jig is that it's not displacing water like that big swim bait is. It's not moving that water where those fish can immediately track it. Now, if you add a rattle to it, if you add a big trailer to it, they'll be able to find it better. But even so, in order for that jig to move enough water for them to easily find it, you want to move it. So when we fish this jig in that cold, cold water, we're going to be a little more aggressive. I'm going to let that bait hit bottom. And I don't worry too much about depth. Start shallow, fish deep. Normally these fish will flood up to the bank at night. You might catch them in two feet of water when the water's 38 degrees. But sometimes they're back down. So start up high and then work your way down. But when I fish that jig at night, I fish it like I mean it. I'm trying to have enough movement that that fish can feel it and eat it right away. Opposite of the swim bait. We're giving them two very different presentations. That ultra slow, are you in the mood to bite, come find the bait and eat it, versus you've got a meal in front of you right now and you've got about a quarter second to decide if you're gonna eat it or you're gonna let this go. And the reason we do that is we're covering all our bases. We're getting the fish that wanna feed and we're getting the fish that are willing to feed right now for a short window. So that jig, the way I work it, is a quick double pop. I don't know if you can see the bait in the tank or not, but that's how I work that jig. What I'm doing in my mind, now I don't know what the fish think I'm doing, but in my mind, when I watch crawdads and they get spooked, the first thing they do is pop up and then the next thing they do is bolt. It's two motions, they pop up and they go. So that's what I'm trying to do with that jig. That first twitch is getting me up off the bottom, the second one runs. And those fish are either gonna hit it or they're gonna let it go. Then the last bait that we'll throw out there in the dark of all things is that spinner bait. And I touched on that last year. And the reason why I bring that bait up every year is frankly because of how well it works. We throw the biggest, ugliest, nastiest spinner baits we can find put the ugliest trailer on it that you can find and you just slow roll that thing. It moves a lot of water, it's bright, it's ugly, the fish can feel it. I don't know what it is, man. When you go to a fishery where bass love to eat trout and they love to eat kokanee and the only thing you can ever do is throw, go out in the middle of the day and throw that bait and try and get one giant bite and then all of a sudden it's nighttime and the lights go out and that same fish that's brilliant during the day will just turn around and eat this stupid spinner bait. I don't know what to say about that other than they, they really do. They really will just turn around and eat it. I throw the ugliest spinner bait I can get my hands on. I love white and chartreuse. Now something I'll tell you that I didn't, I didn't mention last year, I just forgot to say it, is that when you read on spinner bait fishing at night, what are you supposed to use? What blade are you supposed to throw? Colorado blade. The only blade that I will throw on a spinnerbait at night is a willow. I don't even know the answer to that. I do know that every blade is very, very different in the water. 
the vibration is very, very different. Whatever it is that a, a Colorado blade is imitating is not what the bass in my lakes are eating. And it's probably not what the bass in your lakes are eating. The vibration that comes off of a willow gets bit. It's ugly, it works. In this end of the state, you can catch double digits on that ugly spinnerbait in the dark. They will eat that thing. And it will be the same fish that would only eat a perfectly presented swim bait in the daylight. The night is a phenomenal opportunity for you guys to get out there and catch those fish. On that note, I think we'll wrap it up. Tim and I are both gonna stick around for quite a while. Any questions that you guys have, you come find us, we're happy to answer them for you. Uh, I really appreciate you guys coming out here. Again, any questions, if you wanna look at these baits, check out that brand new reel. Just come down here to the bottom of the tank and we'll, uh, we'll let you take a look at everything. But we'll get out of Jimmy's way, let him come up here.